Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Hello again, folks. Welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire. Now, I've allowed four hours for this walk around a village. The last time I allowed four hours for anywhere was in Fiskerton in the West Lindsay series. And that place was very small. This one, well, I need the four hours because it's very, very big. In fact, this place claims to be the largest village in England. Let's see if it is. Welcome to Cottingham. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Cottingham, village in Ketts Water Meadows. Welcome to the largest village in England. That's apparently the claim made by the residents of Cottingham, a huge village located between Hull and Beverley with a population that eclipses that of some small towns. It's absolutely loaded with history too, this one, so it was a challenge to fit it all in. Nonetheless, I've had a good go. Cottingham's name is thought to derive from both British and Saxon root words. Cot is from Ket, relating to the deity Keridwen, Ing is a water meadow, and Ham means village. So this is literally the village in Ket's water meadows. This is a village packed with everything imaginable. Cottingham has two castles, one of which isn't really a castle in truth, but still holds some importance. The other gives the place a royal connection by way of King Edward I and his wife, both of whom later had pubs named after them. Industrially, Cottingham was booming from the 18th century onwards. Snuff was made here in a huge mill, and with the coming of the railway station in the 1850s, heavy industries like gasworks and cloth mills soon followed. The University of Hull have had a huge presence in this village too in recent times. Cottingham was the site of many halls of residence, which have all now closed. There's way, way more, so let's walk and discover some of the rest. We start this mammoth walk on Snuff Mill Lane, and you don't need to be a genius to work out how this road gets its name. That there is the Snuff Mill, the first time such a building has ever been seen on the channel. Snuff, for those who don't know, is a finely ground type of tobacco, which is literally sniffed into the nose as opposed to being smoked. It was first manufactured in Cottingham during the 18th century, and this mill, owned by Quaker William Travis, was producing 1,500 weight of snuff per week by the end of it. Travis also had a three-storey house built next door to the mill in 1750. The mill is the main attraction on this road, but these cottages cannot be overlooked. A fine example of early social housing, these are the NER retirement cottages built in the 1930s. NER stands for North Eastern Railway, the company that was the predecessor of the current rail operator LNER. And speaking of the railway, it ain't far away. At the end of Snuff Mill Lane, we turn right onto Thwaite Street to find the line that crosses the village. Thwaite Street gives its name to a huge hall at the end of this road, which has links to the University of Hull. Let's see what both are about. 
The railway line is one we've seen before, but as of yet, not this far south. This is the Hull to Scarborough line, or the Yorkshire Coast line to give it its alternative name. Cottingham Station is the first stop north of Hull on this route, and we'll be seeing that in a few short moments. Once over the railway, look to your left and you might spot a botanic garden. They cover an area of approximately one hectare and have been owned by the University of Hull since 1948. Even though the University don't have a presence in Cottingham anymore, the botanic gardens are still maintained by them. Cottingham's connection to the University is quite substantial. There were several halls of residence in the village. One of them was Clemenson Hall, created in 1951. It was built on land directly to the south of Thwaite Hall and later expanded in 1960. Clemenson Hall closed in 2004 and the site was redeveloped into a housing estate. Thwaite Hall occupies the corner opposite. It originated as Thwaite House between 1803 and 1807. It became a hall of residence in the 1930s after several ownership changes. It was the biggest hall in the village too, with 187 rooms. Now we're heading north and our next landmark is Cottingham Bowling Club. This can be found on New Village Road and there's a story behind this area. This part of Cottingham exists thanks to Thomas Thompson. Keep his name in mind for later. He was instrumental in the establishment of land that would be set aside for poor families. In 1819, parish officers reserved 12 acres of land, previously used to fund repairs to the church, for the use of 20 such families. This land became known as the Pauper Village before being renamed New Village in 1829. Okay, so after using a public footpath that runs parallel to New Village Road, we've ended up at Cottingham Railway Station, and here it is in all its glory. In a moment, we're going to go over a bridge to the other side and head up towards New Village Road again to take on our next area. But first, let's talk about this. Cottingham Station serves the northern suburbs of Hull and most of the people who use it work in the city. The station was opened along with the rest of the line from Hull in 1846. The station building was designed by George Andrews and originally consisted of two platforms, a station master's house and waiting rooms. The footbridge was restored by Network Rail in 2021. Cottingham once had a goods shed and a coal depot to the west of the line. Goods traffic ended in 1970, but when it was in operation, exports included agricultural produce and livestock. All services that use this line call here, giving Cottingham a basic half hourly service in each direction. Since 2019, many hull-bound services continue onward to either Sheffield via Doncaster or York via Selby. You can even get a direct train to London from here once a day. Station Road is an interesting area. It's heavily industrialised and again there's a reason why. The railway brought industry, and lots of it, which in turn prompted massive urban growth. By all accounts, in the 1850s, Cottingham was a substantial village. Industries established around that time included a sawmill and a gasworks north of the railway station. During the 20th century, the gasworks became station mills. It was owned by Paley and Donkin and made oil press cloths. The mill buildings still exist today as part of an expansive industrial and commercial site. At the end of the road, we hit Northgate for the first time. It won't be the last. This eastern end of it has some rather large and characterful properties. To the north are several residential cul-de-sacs. A footpath off this one, Millbeck Lane, leads directly to a nature reserve, which was supposed to be the next big landmark. The road and the reserve take their name from this stream, the Millbeck, which cuts its way across Cottingham under all of the housing. However, even the best laid plans have flaws. This path was far too dangerous to walk on, owing to a steep bank on the left-hand side. Well, I am actually genuinely gutted that this path is too muddy and too steep to follow. It doesn't look it on the camera like I've just said, but trust me, it is quite steep, this bank. And it's so muddy and slippy and there's nothing to hold on to. The, the fence ends here and the last thing I want is to end up 
in the back. <laughs> so I'm going to turn around at this point. So it means I have to cut a little bit of the route off. Going up there though, uh, you might, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know because I've not actually tried to, to go up there and see, uh, you might be able to see something here. This is the training ground for Hull City, Hull City Football Club. I was hoping to get a couple of shots of that from this path, but I'm not able to actually do it, apparently. So uh, yeah, we'll turn around and rejoin the route further up. Had I have caught anything of the training ground, I'd have been talking about it at this point. It was built on a site previously owned by Northern Foods. The enforced change of route though seizes on a different kind of sports field. These are the King George V playing fields and football is played here too. These fields are the home of East Riding Rangers, a club that was formed in the year 2000 with two junior sides. It now has 14 and an academy. In 2011 the club progressed to senior Saturday football. Let's make our way through their training facilities towards Park Lane. At this point I'd been going for just over an hour. Make no mistake about it, Cottingham is a big village. Even though we've covered quite a lot already, most of the important stuff is in the village centre. All around its edges housing is plentiful. Not all of the buildings were originally constructed as dwellings though. One such example on Northgate is the Toll House, built to collect monies from the users of a turnpike. Two such roads existed in the village. One ran from Beverley to Hessel, the other from Cottingham to Newlands. Northgate was part of the latter, turnpiked in 1764. Now we hit the lawns. During World War II, a temporary camp for housing refugees stood here, near Cottingham Grange. The Grange itself was officers' quarters. After being demolished before the 1950s, the site was split between the new Cottingham Secondary School and the University of Hull. The latter developed several halls of residence here, beginning with Ferrens Hall, a neo-Georgian block which went up in 1956. Several more followed and in total the buildings housed almost a thousand students. They closed in 2019 and now the lawns is used by Humberside Police. Cottingham High School is further up Harland Way. It's not on the route because it's out of the way. It has specialist arts college status with facilities for media and the performing arts. In July 2011, the school became an academy. Notable alumni include Dave Stead, the drummer with the band The Beautiful South. Next for us, it's the Cottingham Municipal Cemetery off Mill Lane. This is not the only purpose-built cemetery here, but it is the oldest, dating back to 1890. Weirdly though, the earliest recorded interment in here dates back to 1889, the year before it was officially opened. The most famous grave in this cemetery belongs to the poet Philip Larkin, who died in 1985. His grave is marked by a bronze statue. You can walk through this cemetery onto Eppleworth Road. Due to that fact, this one is commonly known as Eppleworth Road Cemetery. Next up, we're heading east again, into the Dean Woodland. Now, of course, this isn't in any way, shape or form as big as the nature reserve I was forced to cut off, but I imagine it to be a scaled down version. Prone to flooding, at the centre of this haven of tranquillity amongst suburbia is a peaceful little lake. We've reached our first pub. This is the Fair Maid, which is named after a royal figure in the Middle Ages. The lady in question was Joan Plantagenet, better known as the Fair Maid of Kent, and often described as the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England. Keep her in mind, we'll talk more about her in a moment. The pub overlooks the super pretty West Green, which was just starting to get a bit of colour in the early days of spring. Fabulous. The green also has a phone box, white of course in the East Riding, and a very detailed information board for us to look at. Okay, so handily here we've got a map and I can show you exactly where we are. We are on West Green, which is right there. Now in a moment I'm going to be exploring the village centre, which is all this bit here. 
it's not actually all that big of a village centre considering how big how big the village is generally speaking we'll see in a moment now just before we do that you can see to the north of west green this here says baynard castle site of if i turn the camera around baynard castle is behind those houses there now it's on private property so we can't get to it but i can solve that problem by way of a few pictures can't i so let's talk about that next Baynard was a moated castle built in the 12th and 13th centuries. Historically, it was referred to by terms including the castle at Cottingham or Stoopville's castle. The term Baynard castle is only common in literary works dated 19th century or later. Baynard is one of two landmarks in Cottingham which can be termed a castle. We'll get to the second one later. This one was an actual castle though, and the remains are physical evidence of Cottingham's connection with royalty. References to a manor house at the castle site date to as early as the 1170s. In 1201, a license to fortify the castle was issued and soon a moat had been built and a boundary wall and double ditch were noted by 1282. It's said that King Edward I stayed at Baynard Castle when he returned from his Scottish wars and subsequently purchased Wyke upon Hull in 1299. That settlement would go on to be Kingston, literally King's Town, upon Hull. Edward I was married to Joan Plantagenet, the Fair Maid. That gave her the title of the Countess of Kent, hence her acquired name. By her marriage to Edward, Joan gave birth to King Richard II, so connecting the manor of Cottingham with royalty. So what happened to the castle? Well, it was probably built of wood, which was ultimately its downfall. It was destroyed by fire in the early 16th century when King Henry VIII threatened to visit the Lord of Cottingham. Fearing the King's intentions towards his wife, the Lord arranged for an accidental fire to destroy the castle. Subsequently, Henry never made a visit to Cottingham. The castle remains, basically just the moat, can still be seen, but they're on private land. Back to the route. The Fair Maid isn't the only pub on West Green. Here's another, this time the Blue Bell. This attractive building is split into a bar and restaurant, the latter of which has a log fire. Open mic music nights are held here every Wednesday, and there's a jazz club on Sundays. Nice. Around the corner onto Finkel Street, here's Blue Kangaroo, which is a soft play centre, the ideal place to bring children up to eight years old to play, have fun, and make new friends. Beyond that, Finkel Street is a long residential row, but soon the houses start to give way to major features. Now then, have you ever heard of the term Darby and Joan? If not, it's generally used to signify a loving, virtuous married couple. The names derive from a mid-18th century ballad by Henry Woodfall. Cottingham has a Darby and Joan Hall, which holds everything from slimming classes to small productions and workshops. Over the road is the Cottingham Memorial Club, situated within Elm Tree House. Sited on land bought in around 1809, originally it was a house owned by various merchants, the last of whom was a gentleman of German heritage called Gunter Lutz. Now we're on the very edge of the village centre and kicking us off in this compact town-like central square is the post office at the end of Finkel Street. Although I'd seen several notice boards up to this point, it was here that seemed to be the ideal place to mark Cottingham off the East Riding list. Over the road is the Civic Hall. Both this and the adjoining council offices are managed by the Cottingham Village Trust, formed in 2016. East Riding of Yorkshire Council retain ownership of the buildings. Among its many events, the Civic Hall hosts the Cottingham Folk Festival on an annual basis. The hall is located on Market Green, the de facto village square, which is primarily a car park. With every retail outlet imaginable, shopping-wise, Cottingham has enough to be classified as a town in my opinion. There are two main streets, Hallgate and King Street, which cross each other. On King Street there's a Millennium Clock, added to celebrate the turn of the 21st century. It stopped working last year and was repaired by Smith of Derby, who we've often mentioned before. You can get no less than six buses on this street too, to places including Hull, Hessel and Beverley. Another pub is nearby, this is the Duke of Cumberland, which was once the favourite of Philip Larkin. This is the largest pub in Cottingham and the fourth oldest building in the village. It was first known as the Duke of Cumberland's Head when sold by Robert Harker in 1775. A word on the market square before we go any further too. Cottingham's market charter was granted in 1319, which also allowed two annual fairs. A market is still held here every Thursday. 
Incidentally, Cottingham historically was a notable centre of market gardening, which supplied Hull. Yet more pubs for you next. Up a little alley off King Street is the back of the Hallgate Tavern, a welcoming local with a great social calendar. It's known as a sports pub because matches are shown there regularly. The alley, by the way, is opposite this branch of Costa. Next door is another pub, this time the towering monolith that is the Tiger Inn. This is widely known locally for being a craft union pub. Perhaps not so well known though is the fact that it's supposedly haunted. By what or whom is debatable, but strange bangs and thuds have been heard within its ancient walls. So now we're off down Hallgate and this is where most of the shops and businesses are. The reason for this is quite logical. Hallgate runs from east to west from the medieval church of St Mary to West Green. That means anciently it was a direct route between the church and Baynard Castle. More pubs now. This is the King William IV, better known to the locals as the King Billy. This was founded in the 19th century and it's been a staple in the community for over 200 years, offering a traditional atmosphere and a gathering place for locals and visitors alike. In addition to the King Billy, Hallgate has a brand new micropub called the Hugh Fitz Baldrick, which opened in 2018. Its name is a historical reference to the nobleman and feudal baron who owned Cottingham after the Norman Conquest. Religious buildings can be found along here too. You don't need to walk far to find the Methodist Church, which was built in 1878 and 79. It's still in use. Cottingham's history with Methodism goes back much further. In addition to this, there was a primitive chapel on King Street. Built in 1828 and still standing, we'll be passing that shortly. Next door is the Garden of Remembrance, dedicated to all the Cottingham locals lost in the various global conflicts. It has wrought iron entrance gates bearing the names of those who gave their lives in both the world wars. The garden has attractive floral beds and a central lawned area. Moving on, Hallgate shops are plentiful and quite diverse. In fact, Cottingham can claim to have some of the more unusual business premises in the East Riding. Take this next one for example. At 197 Hallgate is Art Market, a contemporary art gallery that's been selling local pieces for more than 20 years. It's the Zion Chapel next. This was established in 1819 originally for the independence. It replaced a pre-1800 Presbyterian building. After that, Hallgate starts to reach its conclusion, and in the distance, West Green starts to come into view. For us then, it's a right turn up George Street. This is named after George Knowsley, a whole merchant and banker who lived at Cottingham Grange. He had an outlandish idea to link Cottingham to the Humber Estuary by way of a canal, but it was never built. That was due to a lack of funds, thanks to the war between Britain and France around that time. Well, I think my estimate of four hours is about right. We are just about two hours in now, and we are about halfway round. And speaking of things that are halfway round, we've only seen half of the village centre, because what we're doing now is walking up George Street to get back to Northgate, to then come back down into the village centre and towards the church. So uh, yeah, there's more to see in the middle of uh, the village just yet. We're in familiar territory here, now back on Northgate, this is the entrance to the King George V playing fields, which we earlier crossed. This time we're heading east to a pair of mini roundabouts either side of Cottingham's biggest supermarket, an Aldi. At the first one, you'll see this building. That's the Cottingham Rifle, Pistol and Air Weapons Club. Again, it's not something you expect to see. It has a 25-yard indoor rifle range, and some of its members also frequent the outdoor range at Kermington in North Lincolnshire. Moving on again, these flats bring us to the second donut. Oh look, it's another pub. Welcome to the Cross Keys, a Tetley's pub and another traditional local. Just east of this pub was the home of Abraham Martin, a Lincolnshire lad who became well known under his trading name of Martin and Son. He was the proprietor of Cottingham Nurseries in the early 1800s. Most of Providence Place, the property that the Martins were tenants of, is now long gone and east of the pub now is a dental surgery. Over the road, a petrol station rounds off Northgate nicely. Let's go back to King Street now and check out its northern end. Here's the Aldi store, the biggest and newest supermarket here, having opened its doors in 2018. It stands on the site of the former Needler Hall. 
That was another hall of residence that was named in honour of Hull-based sweets manufacturer Frederick Needler, a major benefactor of the University College. Right across the road is a health centre, and this is next door to Hallgate Primary School. Pupils from the school conducted Aldi's opening ceremony along with Team GB slalom canoeist Etienne Stott, who won gold at the London 2012 Olympics and was later honoured with an MBE. This is likely to be one of the most recent additions to the village, a Platinum Jubilee bench just beyond the school. Over the road from this is the Sanctum, a multi-award winning medical and aesthetic clinic which is right next to the former Primitive Methodist Chapel that we mentioned earlier. A bit further up the street is the privately owned Hallgarth Residential Care Home, which has stood in its own mature ground since 1999. Rounding off this stretch of King Street is another square. This one includes a big co-op supermarket and the Hallgate Garden Centre, amongst many other things. Now to the parish church dedicated to St Mary the Virgin. This was built between 1272 and 1370 in a cruciform shape. The tower was built later in the 15th century. The church is made of stone and is constructed in a mixture of the decorated and perpendicular Gothic styles. Capuchin friar Nicholas de Luda, who died in 1382, at some point built or rebuilt the chancel. He's commemorated in the church by way of a monumental brass. St Mary's was designated a Grade 1 listed building in 1967, and even though Cottingham has vastly grown since it was built, it remains its focal point. On the footpath nearby is a workhouse, known as the Church House. This was built in 1729 and later modified. The land it stands on was purchased by Richard Burton. The church has monuments to two other Burton family members, Ralph and William. Next door is a former school. This is the Mark Kirby Free School, which was originally established in 1666 by John Wardle. In 1712, Mark Kirby left an endowment of land to support the school, and that led to its renaming. Wardle also established an almshouse here too, but he died before it was completed. Speaking of schools, here's another one. Opposite the church is the former Hallgate Junior School site, an old Victorian building that the locals all love. In 2009 it became an independent Christian school called Focus, one of the few Plymouth Brethren schools in the UK. Now though, that school is no more here after the trust that ran it up sticks and moved it to Scunthorpe. Moving on, off we trot next down Arlington Avenue and Kingtree Avenue, two streets that run around the back of a cul-de-sac containing the Holy Cross Catholic Church, which is not on our route. Both these roads are also named after historic halls. Via a path, we've now reached Newgate Street, which becomes South Street to the west. The boundary is the end of King Street. Here's one final look up that, back towards the village centre. From now on, landmarks are going to get a bit more sparse. South Street takes you past the front of Elm Tree House. This is Grandad's Park in front of the historic building we met earlier. This pleasant green used to be part of the Elm Tree House estate. How this got its more common name is beyond me, I'm afraid. Next, it's a long walk through a vast residential area to our next big landmark. Walking through all those housing estates might have seemed a little bit pointless. Well, not so, because in doing so, we have reached this building here, Southwood Hall, which I can't really get a very good shot of because, as you can see, it's A, behind a hedge to the left and B, behind all these lovely trees down its drive. Can't see much more than this here, but it's another very historic building and we're going to talk a bit about why it's a historic building as we make our way back towards Snuffwell Lane. Southwood Hall is a manor house built in 1661. That makes it one of, if not the oldest, residential property in the village. It's now a Grade 2 listed building. It once stood all alone, surrounded only by fields. 
as you can see, that ain't the case anymore. Post-World War II, extensive urban development and expansion took place in this area, with most of the development being semi-detached dwellings. The expansion has, though, stopped short of connecting Cottingham to Hull to the south. A greenbelt still exists between them, and the village instead blends into the city to the east. Now we come to the Close, which has a small parade of shops that serve this southern estate. There used to be a pub here as well. It was called the Black Prince. In 2015 it was closed and for a while it was left boarded up. Nowadays it's reopened, but not as a pub, rather it's a Tesco Express store. The name is connected to a pub we saw earlier. You see, the Black Prince was the nickname of Edward I, the husband of Joan Plantagenet, the Fair Maid. Isn't it great how all these little details just fit together sometimes? Through the estate we continue next, towards a school. Before we hit the school, we have Overton House, a specialist dementia care home for 40 people that's run by the Hicker Group. This has its own amenities, including hairdressers and three gardens where residents can grow vegetables and flowers. Bacon Garth Primary School is next door. In total, Cottingham has four primary schools. The two we haven't seen are Westfield Primary School near the Dean Woodlands and Croxby Primary School, which serves Cottingham and the Bricknell Avenue area of Hull. Croxby was the worst affected school in the Hull area during the national floods in June 2007. Now speaking of flooding, our final landmark on the walk is the second cemetery, Priory Woods, and this too has had its watery issues in the past. However now that's hopefully a thing of the past. In 2023 massive improvements were made to this cemetery, which included increased burial space, decorative limestone walls and a comprehensive drainage system to tackle flooding after heavy rainfall. This cemetery features a special pet garden where owners can scatter the ashes of their cherished furry friends. There are plans to include a pet crematorium here in the future. Okay, we are almost all the way around Cottingham. All I've got to do now is take a path that runs along the edge of Priory Wood Cemetery and it takes me back to Snuff Mill Lane. Let me tell you, I am absolutely exhausted. I have been nearly four hours walking around this. I don't know the actual time because I haven't looked at Strava, but trust me, this has been a Herculean effort. And trust me, when people say this is the biggest village in England, I think they're right. There's still more to cover. I told you this place was big. Cottingham is widely known in the Hull area for having not just one, but two hospitals. This is the main one, Castle Hill. It stands on the site of Cottingham Castle, which wasn't really a castle in truth. Between 1814 and 1816, Thomas Thompson, the man we mentioned earlier, built a large Gothic house on high ground about a mile west of Cottingham. The house became known as Cottingham Castle, even though it never was. It could have been termed a grand mansion, I suppose, but it didn't last long. It burnt down in 1861, and the only remaining evidence of it that still stands is Thompson's Tower, pictured here. Between 1913 and 1916, the development of Castle Hill Hospital began on its site. Initially, it was a tuberculosis sanatorium, but was soon extended westwards between 1921 and 1939 with the addition of an infectious diseases hospital. Castle Hill is a busy place now. It was further extended in 2009 with the addition of an oncology and a haematology unit, collectively known as the Queen Centre. A cancer centre for teenage patients was then added in 2011. Just south of Castle Hill is another hospital site, a group of buildings known as the Humber Centre. Mostly this area is new, but history once again is under our feet, or tyres if you will. This was the site of Della Pole Hospital, a name which strikes fear into many of the locals. It was a mental health facility, and technically it was in Willoughby. It was located on a site previously occupied by Della Pole Farm, and was designed by Frederick Stead Broderick and Richard George Smith in the Victorian Gothic style. It opened as Kingston upon Holborough Asylum in December 1883, before becoming the Willoughby Mental Hospital in the 1990s. 
1920s. After the introduction of care in the community in the early 1980s, the hospital declined and closed in 1998. The main buildings have been demolished and that part of the site was redeveloped as business units. The only hospital building that survives is its former chapel. A Grade 2 listed building, this is now used as part of Halton Price Crematorium. Delapol Hospital had some horrific links to disgraced entertainer and TV personality Jimmy Savile. That's not something I want to go into, but if you want to read the allegations and investigations into his actions here, there's a link below. And here's a few more bits that I couldn't fit in elsewhere. To the northeast of the village is a big factory, owned and run by caravan manufacturing company Swift. Founded as Swift Leisure in 1964 by Ken Smith, the company started with a single brand of caravans based on a distinctive tri-front window design. The company moved manufacturing from Hedden Road in Hull to Dunswell Lane in 1970. In the early 2000s, they moved again to an adjacent site to allow for the expansion of their production facilities, investing the eye-watering sum of £6.8 million to do so. A new connection to the A1079 Beverley Bypass was built specially for the upgraded factory, and now that road is the only way to access the factory by vehicle. Cottingham has a few water-related tales to tell. In the late 1300s, dikes were made to supply Hull with fresh water from a source between Cottingham and Anlaby. This led to riots and about a thousand people laid siege to Hull, threatening to raise it to the ground. It was ultimately unsuccessful and some of the ringleaders were hanged at York. In 1402, there was more hostility for the same reasons. This time, salt water was let into the Hull supply and it was tainted with the carcasses of dead animals for good measure. Disputes over the matter continued until Pope Alexander V was forced to step in, urging people to desist for their own spiritual well-being. In 1890, a pumping station named Mill Dam was opened north of the village centre, which supplies Hull via three boreholes. West of the village at Keldgate, a reservoir was constructed in 1909 with a capacity of about 10 million imperial gallons. That represented about a day's usage back then. The reservoir was expanded in the 1930s, adding a further 8 million imperial gallons to its capacity. A water treatment works was then added in 1999. To the northwest of the village there was a deer park, first recorded in the 13th century. The park was 12 miles in circumference and located in the area now known as Cottingham Park. Including Kroll Park and Burn Park, it's thought to have fallen out of use and been let for pasture by the 16th century. Most of it is now a golf course. And finally, Cottingham was the birthplace of the 1940s and 50s female boxing champion Barbara Buttrick, the first female boxer to have a fight broadcast on national television. That's it. I'm sure there's way more than this, but Cottingham is so big it's hard to condense it all into a 40-minute video. See you next time in the East Riding, where we'll be at the seaside once again. Thanks for watching this video folks, don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already, it really makes a difference with YouTube. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it. You can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel. Also if you've enjoyed this episode, have a look at some more videos in this series. Until next time, I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out.